this is a time in which we really need innovation. We need new ways to adapt agriculture to changing conditions. And we need to get this information from around the world and consolidate it and bring it to bear to allow agriculture itself to become more resilient. My name is Pablo Eseguirre and I work at uh, Bioversity International in Rome. I'm an anthropologist. Now we've worked a lot on individual crops, uh, looking at how they contribute traits and resilience to agriculture. But increasingly we see that a lot of the conservation and a lot of the value comes when these elements of biodiversity are inserted in a landscape. A landscape is a human construct. It's not just nature as it was handed to us. It's the interaction between people and nature. And they'll often, there's a mountain. Now the mountain was made by nature, but the terraces are the way people have shaped that mountain in order to retain the water and produce things. In other areas, you'll see desert margins, which without the actions of, of people and communities would become very barren and monotonous places, but people uh, protect trees at these desert margins. They bring animals in that provide often uh, nutrients to the soil. They uh, disperse the seeds. When you have these landscapes managed by people, you have a buffering effect. And the same can be said with many of these changes that are occurring in the environment, such as climate change. The actions of people at the landscape level can be very positive for the environment. In, uh, in high mountain uh, landscapes, people often use the gradient of temperature as you go up the mountain to, to maximize the diversity that they can grow in a very small area. But what's happening with climate change is many of the colder parts of the mountain, which had produced these very distinctive types of frost, uh, potatoes that could grow under frost, these potatoes are no longer possible to grow because the temperature has risen and these potatoes have nowhere to go. Well, a lot of uh, areas of Kenya, particularly in the western part of Kenya and the northern part of Kenya, are severely affected by climate change. Maize has been an important crop in Kenya and still is the main source of food. However, for many of these farmers in these landscapes at the margins of the growing area, there's been a major shift, an adaptation. For example, a switch to sorghum, some of the traditional um, grain legumes, pigeon pea, uh, cow pea, and then some of these indigenous fruit trees are being brought into the farm. As the forests become diminished or threatened, they're bringing them onto the farm and tending them. And together, they're providing a more secure livelihood than relying on a single crop, which would have been maize. In many cases, what we find is that traditional agriculture with these biocultural elements is often around protected areas as well. Notice, for example, in Cuba, where we have traditional agriculture that dates almost to the pre-Columbian times, the traditional uh, conuco agriculture, still exists along the boundaries of these protected areas. And, and increasingly, the, the protected area managers are turning to these farming communities that have been there for ideas and ways to incorporate these types of land management techniques into the conservation program. So this is really the time to, to take these lessons from the landscapes around the world and apply them and scale them up. And uh, Bioversity, my institution, is able to do this because we have a global uh, perspective. And it'll work provided that these landscapes are also productive for people and that they maintain the biodiversity that makes them and these families and these communities and these areas competitive.